Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Let's try again. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Thank you for being here. Welcome to our uh, seminar on how to prepare for California's mandatory zero net energy. My name is Allison. I'm with AOA, the Apartment Owners Association. I cover all of Northern California from my Alameda office. I can help you with landlord tenant advice, questions, membership issues, forms, credit services. We can help set that up for you. If everyone can please turn off your cell phone or set it to silent. There's no food allowed during class. If you need the restroom, it is back to the open space. There's a short hallway to the right. There's two restrooms located there. Uh, we'd like to thank you for attending this event at the Santa Clara Convention Center. And uh, I want to thank all of our valued members for attending today's seminar. If you are not a member, um, I hope that you find today's seminar highly informative and join our association. Please see me after the seminar if you have any questions about membership and the benefits you can receive as a member, such as free seminars. Um, the, uh, also, as a uh, member, one of the benefits is that you can bring guests for free to our event. You just have to reserve the number of seats that you need in advance. You should be receiving AOA's email alerts to stay informed with upcoming seminars and important news that can affect your business. To start receiving AOA email alerts, you can see me after the seminar. The email alerts are very important because they're our first point of contact with you. Whenever a law changes or a city council enacts a new ordinance or any rent freezes or changes in local cities, we send out an email blast. So we alert all members of AOA uh, or anyone that is on our email uh, information list, letting you know of those new changes as, as they're happening. Uh, sometimes we can let you know in advance of city council events, uh, any um, uh, meetings that may be held by the city in local areas, uh, letting you know what's going on, that you can attend and have your voice heard at how the city changes will be affecting you as an owner. You can also properly screen your tenants with AOA's landlord pre-screening services that are cost-effective, comprehensive, and for AOA members only. For today's event, we would like if you can hold personal questions until the end of the seminar. We have time reserved at the end just for personal question and answer. If you have a question about items that are on the board, uh, on the slideshow, uh, you may raise your hand depending on time the speaker may call on you. Uh, we have a few seminar events coming up in September. We're going to have a class on estate planning. We'll have our yearly speaker, Ken Ziskin, will be here again. And then in October, we're having a new class about property seizures. We've never had that topic before. It's going to be very informative, and I highly recommend it. You can sign up for that class now online. Our seminar events, we're now using a new program uh, called Eventbrite. And you might see our emails with that name. That is through AOA. We have all of our seminars ready registered on that website and you do have to fill out a registration form to sign up but the first time it may be difficult if you have any issues you can call our office we can sign you up over the phone and it's very easy and quick um, and then if, if you have any issues with uh, registering for seminars you can certainly call our office or send us an email so that we can better assist you and then today we have our speakers uh, we have Ken Stout, who is the VP of Economic Development for Alpha Energy Management. Alpha started as a telecom e energy company in the year 2000 and later got into the solar industry in 2010. Ken has been in the solar industry since 2006, working and in installing over 10 megawatts of bead in tariff solar farms, commercial and residential market. Ken has helped several startup solar companies in the last 12 years. Alpha is now partnering with Apollo Energies, working to establish zero net energy for the state of California. And from Apollo Energies, we have the president and founder, Mark Stout. Mark is a uh, Mark and a background in construction, telecommunications, information technology, and worked for companies like Pacific Bell, which is now uh, AT&T, and Intel before starting one of the first global ISPs to serve the business community. Realizing the threat of a warning, a warning climate, Mark earned his certification in business uh, building science and used his ex experience in construction um, by counseling property owners on how to best reduce their energy use without spending a fortune doing it. Today we have Mark and Ken Stout. Thank you. Hi guys. I got a special surprise for you guys. <laughs>
play that, that song. Of course, you guys remember that song was from the last century. You remember that one? But what was the name of that song? What a Wonderful World, right? And what are we talking about today? We're talking about our world today, aren't we? So that's, that's the reason why I, I uh, decided to play that song, because uh, this topic is really important for me and for everyone here. And, and I, I want to congratulate everyone for coming down here today, because it's really important that we talk about you know, uh, our clean environment, uh, about going from dirty energy to clean energy. And uh, whether you, you believe in climate change or not, it, the thing is, is we need to uh, clean up our planet, and clean up our communities, and change. And, and you guys are part of that community. And I want to, let's give a round of applause for everyone for sharing. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, uh, basically, we have quite a bit to, uh, to talk about today. And uh, Mark uh, is, is actually not my, uh, my relative. He's actually my, my brother from another mother and father, because we have the same last name. <laughs> but actually, that guy right there, he's, he's my brother. So. <laughs> from the same mother. From the same mother. So, from the same mother. Anyways, as, as you can see in the, in the topic here, how to prepare for California's mandatory zero net energy laws. This is really, really important. So everybody here probably doesn't have the slightest idea what's going to happen, just like we did for a while. Uh, and I've been in the solar industry for, for a long time. But we, what we want to do today is try to give you some, some ideas of what California is planning to do, how it will affect your business as well, and how you can contribute as well. Now, in regards to laws, we're, we'll be talking about uh, how, how it, it will affect existing buildings today. We'll be talking about benchmarking, uh, new required reporting of building energy use. And then we'll talk about the benefits of solar, uh, EV charging stations, battery storage options as well. And of course, we'll be talking about compliance assistance and, we, and also trying to find ways to fund these projects for you at no upfront cost, because that's really important for you, all of you. I do have a program that you, if you work with Section 8, there's free uh, 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 funding that's available for, for low-income housing where you can get solar at no cost. They install it. It's, it's actually supported by the state of California. So that's money that's available for you guys today. Uh, zero net energy. What is it? Well, in simple terms, the total amount of energy used by the building on an annual basis is equal to the amount of renewable and energy efficiency created on the site. So, in other words, zero net energy equals energy use minus renewable energy and efficiency energy. So that's the reason why, in simple terms, it becomes zero net energy. And of course, uh, simply adding solar will not make your building uh, zero net energy. You have to use both energy efficiency and solar both. A building energy use must first be reduced. So you have to do energy efficiency first before you get the solar. So we'll be talking about that. Mark will be going over all that today. So why can't I just add solar? Well, solar loses productivity and degrades over time. The cost of electricity is, is rising quickly, and of course everyone knows that in regards to PG&E's prices. Uh, annual true bills are forever increasing. It's efficient roof space and parking uh, availability for your sites. Uh, one of the things you need energy efficiency to be able to do the holistic plan of zero net energy. So reducing energy use first eliminates all the above issues. And of course, the, the four foundations of zero carbon buildings is energy efficiency, renewable energy, uh, storage, and uh, getting rid of carbon. So that's, that's really important. Right? And so what I'd like to do is go ahead and introduce my partner, my brother from another and father, Mr. Mark Stout. Let's give him a round of applause. Morning. Good morning. Um, I'm working for anything. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, um, a little bit about me. I started a company uh, primarily to build solar farms and sell them. I didn't want to, you know, takes about three million at the time. Back in 2009, solar was expensive. Um, <clears throat> took about maybe three million dollars to to build a five kilowatt solar system. Solar array, 
Uh, they were worth with the PPA from PG&E around 10, and so over a 20-year period, and I was going to sell them for five or six or whatever, and do it again. That was my goal. Um, I started doing that, but uh, um, <clears throat> in the process of doing that, I had a few things that were kind of stumbling blocks. I didn't have a $3 million line of credit for the bank, which was required. Mm -hmm. uh, I hadn't paid for an environmental impact study, which was required. And I needed an engineering <laughs> study to find out and make sure the power I was going to generate could go on the low, uh, low, voltage, low, uh, low electric grid. Um, <clears throat> but I figured those things I could get the investor to pay, and if I got on the short list, I could get a $3 million line of credit with the bank, so I wasn't really too concerned about that. And so I was in the working process of working this, and <clears throat> I'd come from, I lost a house up in back of uh, Placerville um, that was supposed to be my retirement. You know, it was a high-end home, built on purpose, so that when I sold it, took the proceeds, jump-started my 401k, because I had that ISP, and I was making bank, but I wasn't banking. <coughs> Uh, but I was like, you know, 35, so I was young, and I wasn't thinking about retirement. <clears throat> so um, I ended up losing it in 2007, before the big crash, it actually started in 2006, for those who are paying attention, and then moved to Vacaville, and I had a single-story 3,000 square foot house. Now the reason I say this is my house in Placerville, I was spending about 1,500 bucks a month on electricity, and they didn't have natural gas, so I was spending about another 500 on propane. And when I went to Vacaville, I was set out of a 4,200 square foot house, went to Vacaville on a 3,000 square foot house that was actually built in 06. I did it, I moved in in 08, and my bill was 400 bucks. And I thought, Psh, no biggie, I'm saving money from 2,000 to 400. <clears throat> but then someone pointed out to me that that was too high. And I looked at her and thought she was crazy. Uh, that happened to be my girlfriend, Bobby, she's in the back of the room. She's from the Midwest, so they deal with cold all the time and deal with energy efficiency. So she said, you got to do this, that, and the other thing, and so we did. <coughs> and my bill dropped 120 bucks. And I thought that was just a fluke. You know, halfway through the month, who cares? That's, that, that's, not, gonna, that's not my normal bill. But six months later, my bill never topped up over 127. And after about a year, her and her daughter moved in, my bill jumped to 20 bucks. So it went from about 125 to about 135. And that was with two more people living in the house. So <clears throat> I saved myself like 275 bucks. And I thought, well, gee, I can't be unique in this scenario. I mean, I'm not the only one that has a $400 bill that could have a $120 bill. So I started looking into ways to uh, identify and be able to say, well, you know, to explain to others how they could be saving $275 a month on their utility bill. And then I, so I got certified, found some programs, California, <coughs> learned about the California Home Upgrade Program, and then the whole strategic plan of going zero net energy by 2050 at the time, and that's actually brought me out down to 2045. So that's how I got into this business. Um, <coughs> looking at this chart right here, 2010, that's about where I started looking at zero net energy, which is energy efficiency you know, as a whole. I wasn't too concerned about the zero net energy because um, I was focused on single family residential apartments or family homes and apartments and just getting them energy efficient. And there were programs for that and they were paying out rebates. Um, <clears throat> but to go zero net energy back in 2009 was a lot more expensive than it was today. Um, in fact, it was prohibitive for the most part. And, but there are people who are early adopters and they took over and they kind of said, well, here's how you can do it. But if you look at what they spend, they spend a fortune. I mean, just to give you an idea, there's a house up in Chico area that um, guy is actually a zero net energy home and he's got a hey. utility bill. It's like a 4,000 square foot home, home and has got a utility bill around 20 bucks, 25 bucks. Mm -hmm. Nobody's got a 4,000 square foot home with a utility bill of 25 bucks. This guy spent probably $150,000, $200,000 getting it, which nobody wants to do. So <clears throat> from a zero to energy perspective, we want to be able to uh, look at reducing the energy use of the building and then capping that off with solar. Because if you just add solar, you still got an inefficient <coughs> building. If you got an inefficient building, that energy use rises and falls, and it's based on how you live in the house. But if you become energy efficient, the house operates on its own. You don't care how you live in it. Today, you care how you live in it. Because you want to save money, you got to turn the thermostat down or up, whichever the case may be, and kind of suffer a little bit. Your, your comforts, 
is uh, compromised. Um, <clears throat> not only yours, but your tenants. And everybody is in the same boat. Whether you live in a house or you live in an apartment, you start getting the same needs. So if I'm comfortable in my unit, and I'm, my thermostat is set, uh, you know, 68 in the, in the wintertime or 64 in the wintertime and, and 78 in the summertime, and I'm comfortable in that, in that range, I'm never going to uh, adjust the thermostat. I'm just going to pay the bill, whatever it is. If I'm cost conscious, I'm going to say, well, maybe I'll go down to 62 degrees. I'll wear a sweater. And maybe I'll wait until it's 82 degrees in the summertime, and I'll just suffer with a fan. Now, that's a comfort choice. But that's a choice we all make. You can make it, you make it, if you're trying to save money. So what we're trying to do is bring that down uh, with energy efficiency, which now the house or the building or the unit <coughs> will operate within 64 to 70 degrees, regardless of who lives in the house or the unit. Now you've got a steady, comfortable um, unit that people are now comfortable in and don't want to move. So that's where right now, we are about at the midway through the early majority portion of that chart. It's about 2019, and we're trying to get over there to uh, 2030, and you know, most of this is for new construction. Zero net energy is uh, all new construction for residential, it has to be zero net energy as of 2020. Commercial, they want zero net energy to start new buildings, need to start being zero net energy on 2030. Um, in the meantime, they want all existing buildings to get at least 50% of existing buildings to get up to zero net energy. So how do you do that? Hopefully that can help you. <clears throat> this is a first scale of where the uh, um, where your building lands on a ZNA uh, zero net energy HERS scale. It's the same zero to 100 you would get in the regular HERS rating but it tells you what you need to be. Zero net energy, <clears throat> most of us will never get to an absolute zero um, on this scale, uh, but the goal is to get to zero. I mean, we still have gas, so there's still gonna be some energy use, um, and, but there is a big push towards electrification. Electrification is where you get rid of all your gas, but nothing but electricity in there. And for those of us who love gas stoves, um, induction stoves work almost identical to a gas stove, and they're not that expensive. So those, uh, electrification though, allows you to go completely zero net energy. You can actually generate the electricity the building uses with the amount of solar you're putting on. The reason you go energy efficient is you don't got enough room on your rooftops to put all the solar you need to offset the electricity use. So you gotta reduce electricity use in order to put a right size system up there so that you can maximize that solar and, and, and do what it does, and do what it needs to do, and that is remove all your energy, right? Um, so that way we can uh, eliminate the energy use and still have rooftop space. If we have to add more panels, because we're not offsetting enough, at least maybe there might be some room. Question. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, what happens if you have to resurface the roof? You gotta pull everything off. No, when you do solar, you look at the roof first. <clears throat> That roof, you have to address the roof first. Correct. Right? So you have to have an engineer come out and take a look at the roof and say, this roof will last for the next 30 years. I know how long my roof is going to last. Yeah, an engineer can tell you that too. <clears throat> so, yeah, I mean, so if you haven't had, if you know your roof's going to last in 10, 10 years and you don't need to replace it, an engineer's going to be able to tell you that same thing. Or he's going to be able to tell you, no, this roof will last another 20. But if, if, okay, so I have a pyramid roof, it has to be, it has to be covered mm -hmm. in, in a special paint mm -hmm. every seven years. Mm -hmm. So I just had it done, I've got another probably six or five years. Well, that's a paint, that's a paint on. So that's basically, nice. you're not going to have solar where you can't access the actual rooftop. But you're not going to, you're not going to want to be replacing that roof with like pulling up the roof deck. <clears throat> so in essence, I can't put solar on the roof. You got to have the roof. Your roof that you need to replace would need to be replaced sooner rather than later because it's still on. Personal questions at the end. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, we tell you what. Just talk to us uh, at the end. I have some answers for you. Okay. Cool. Okay. Thanks. All right. So, do I have to go zero net energy today? No. There's no law saying you must. If you're building a new property, yes, you do. Not well, not today, but beginning 2020. 
what's the requirement for fourplex uh, residential building? 2030 or no? 2020. Fourplex is a single family, consider a single family. Existing building, not Yeah, existing. So 2020? Existing is not, no, existing is not. Existing, the existing, the existing um, buildings have to be zero net energy. They do not have to be zero net energy. So no requirements? No requirements. No, basically between 2020 and 2030 is they're going to require 50% of existing homes to be uh, zero net energy. But they haven't given us all that detail. <coughs> so right now it's just new new single homes and multi family Yeah, what's going to happen is the new, the, the existing buildings, all right, let's back up here. Zero net energy must be done beginning January 1, 2020. You build a brand new building, got to be zero net energy. I don't care what it is. If it's three stories or less, single family, got to be. If you're going to build a high rise or you're working on construction, a commercial, that doesn't have to happen until January 1, 2030. Right. However, the PUC in the state of California is trying to get to a zero net energy economy by 2045. Can't do that if 90% of the existing buildings are still not zero net energy. So there was a push to get you to zero net energy. You don't have to do it, but if you don't do it, your competition will. If your competition's doing it, you're losing out. It's plain and simple. Um, so that's why you would want to do it. Now, it's going to cost you money, and how much? And that's kind of what we're here for. To kind of help you figure out, is this what I want to do? Should I do it? Or should I just be the guy that, you know, you want to go at it, knock yourself out, but I'm not doing the thing. You know, that's that option. But the electricity rates are going up, people are demanding this type of environment for the houses they live in, not only in the houses they live in, but in the, the apartments they rent. And if there's rental people after 2020, you got brand new apartments that are all zero net energy, and then they come and look at yours, I put the two together, I'm going with the zero net energy. My price differential is going to be nominal. And my savings on the utility bill is going to offset the increase that I would pay at a zero net energy building. So it's going to benefit you to go this route. So it's just a matter of how much is it going to cost you. Again, <laughs> new homes and multifamily residentials have a little three stories or less have to be zero net energy on 2021 or 20, January 1, 2020. Um, <clears throat> but the, uh, the uh, state of California is wanting to target a 50% um, conversion rate. In other words, they want 50% of you guys to convert your properties to be zero net energy. And that's actually a good thing because I do homes, single family homes, uh, energy audits on them all day long. And the clientele is not the single mom and single dad or the divorcee, it's the young professionals with kids and the empty nesters. And right now, those are who are demanding these types of uh, um, environments. They want uh, you know the empty nesters, Kids are gone, they want a decent bill, they want to be comfortable in the home, they want a steady utility bill, and they don't want to pay a fortune on the utility bill. Millennials, the young professionals, they got young kids, they want a clean environment, they want clean indoor air, they don't want they want to be comfortable themselves, and they don't want to pay a fortune on the utility bill. And right now the bill is around averaging anywhere from three hundred to six hundred. Um, and we're talking eighteen hundred square foot average house. <laughs> So it's, a, it's a, you know, and that's an 1800 square foot house that is energy efficient before putting on solar <coughs> might have a $50 utility bill. So from 300 to 600 average down to 50, that's a huge chunk. I'd go for it. So that's where, that's where your clientele's at. Now they lose the house, they got to rent, whatever it is, they're gonna want that same environment. And if you got brand new apartments that that way and yours aren't, you know, do the math. <clears throat> what are the advantages? Um, it allows you to increase your rental rates because you're reducing the cost to the tenant by the lower utility bill. He's now comfortable in that home. He's not going to move because why would he? He's going to pay a higher rent or maybe the same rent but a higher utility bill. So the differential between his rent, your rent that you're charging him, and his utility bill is going to be less or more than the differential of the maybe the same rent, but another utility bill that's higher. <clears throat> so his higher his bill is going to be higher. His comfort's going to be better. You get an energy efficient unit, it's more comfortable. Think about this. 
Uh, she doesn't like my styrofoam cup example, but I just use it for purposes. You know if you take a cup, tip it upside down, put it in a bucket of water, air in the cup, keep the water from hitting the bottom of the cup. Over the the bottom of that cup, you can sink the cup, right? That's pressure. Our houses have been built since God knows when, up until maybe 2015, um, like that cup with a hole in it. We got way too much airflow. But you and I just stand next to each other in a room and not feel like we're in each other's space, not feel like the room is stuffy, we need about four to five air changes per hour. In most of our homes, they're anywhere from 12 to 22 air changes per hour. Now back when they built these homes, electricity was cheap and nobody cared. But in a bigger HVAC system that compensated for the air flow and it just it was what it was. Today electricity cost is going through the roof. And nobody wants to spend four or five hundred bucks just because that's the way we've been doing it. And now we know through building science that if we plug up the hole in that styrofoam cup, so to speak, air seal in the building, because we've got air moving in from the bottom of the building, moving up and out through the attic space, through the top of the building. Flat roof, attic roof, doesn't matter. If we plug up that hole, seal up the top of the roof, or the top of the building, we pressurize the house, just like we pressurize that cup. And we pressurize the house, or the unit, whatever it is, now we're more comfortable in that room. It feels more comfortable. And we don't need the BTUs necessary to heat and cool that place. And if you reduce your heat, your BTUs to heat and cool the building, you reduce your energy costs, be it for you and your common areas or for your tenants. And if you're benefiting your tenants, you are putting money back in their pocket, justify the rental increase. Cost less to own. You're not spending as much money again on your common area expenses. Uh, and your maintenance expenses. Um, and if you look at a Z&E building versus a non-Z&E building, the non-Z&E building which costs less to operate is more valuable. So your properties go up, property values. <clears throat> now what does it cost to do our and retrofit? Well, top to bottom, replacing everything, probably going to cost you about 20 grand per unit. That's a lot of money. Tax laws can be have enough tax laws that can actually offset close to 30 to 40 percent of that if you know how to leverage them. And then by that point, you've maximized your energy efficiency, so now you add solar. Solar comes on and finishes off the remaining 60 to 65 percent of that uh, energy use. So at that point, you're now zero in energy. You've eliminated as much energy waste as you can in the building, and then the solar finishes off whatever's left. Um, and then did it with uh, the return on the investment is solar pays for itself in about two years. And then after that, it's not costing you nothing. And there's a lot of benefits for leveraging the tax credits, which actually offsets the cost of that on top of, you know, uh, the, the, um, the rebates and the, um, yeah, just the rebates, huh? Depreciation. And depreciation. <coughs> Sorry. Um, now, from single family home to multi family home, big difference. Okay, you've got a lot of different idiot idiosyncrasies in a multi family home that you don't have in a single family home. So, depending on what type of unit you have, the type of building where it's located, all these factors can come into play to determine what your cost would be. But each, um, each, building, each, each building that you have, regardless of where it is, in regards of how it's built or when it was built, still have the same principles. We still have an airflow in our house, in our rooms, even this one right here. And there's probably 10 air changes per hour in this room because there's so many people here. Three to five would not be enough. We'd feel stuffy, it'd be hot, um, we'd be uncomfortable. Um, so they make it so that there's more airflow in this room because the amount of people that might be in it. But you put this in the room, throw a couple partitions up, maybe a few walls, now maybe all we need is three to five. But if we still had 10, 15 air changes, we'd have to heat and cool that place. And with all that air moving through, <coughs> I gotta have a big energy efficient system. Now that complicates matters because your HVAC system is already too big, so it's oversized, short, short, short cycling, which is generating, having to make it work harder. And when it work hard, works harder, it uses more energy. So if we can downsize the HVAC system to a point where we can now do it with the right size system, we reduce our energy costs. <clears throat> so
some of the measures that we're going to be doing. Uh, there's like over 50, but there's basically <clears throat> some basics that we do. We look at the insulation, we look at walls, we look at airflow. Airflow is your biggest one. Um, but they, depending on where, like I said, wherever you live, it just doesn't matter. The same principle applies, the same method to improving a building is the same. So what you do, how you do it, doesn't really change based on what climate zone you're in and whether you're in Northern California or Southern California, or if you're in New York. <coughs> we all have the same principles. We all build the house the same way. We insulate them a little differently depending on where you are in the country. But outside of that, a wall is framed the same way here as it is in New York and everywhere else. And airflow wasn't an issue, not only here, but anywhere else. So we're no different in that respect. Here's a pyramid of kind of what uh, the loading orders of which we want to start with, um, or we start with. Outside, we look at the understanding of the building, that's where you get energy out of got to know what to fix, I got to know what's broken before you can fix it. So the energy audit identifies what that is. Uh, we do low cost, no cost. There's things you can do on your own. You don't need to hire a contract. You don't need to spend a fortune. You just go out to the Home Depot, buy a few items, go into the unit, fix it up, you're done, right? Spend 20, 30 bucks. Low cost, no cost. Um, lighting is not the first one that I would replace. I would switch the lighting with the air ceiling if this is my chart, not my chart. Um, because air sealing <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> affects everything else going forward. So if you don't plug up the hole in that cup, pressurize the building and reduce the BTUs necessary, everything else you do after that is kind of a waste, especially with the insulation. If you've insulated and I got to go back in there and air seal it, I got to take out all that insulation. And if you, air, if you insulate and you don't air seal, then you haven't addressed the HVAC system. You haven't been able to downsize the HVAC system because you haven't pressurized the house because you haven't slowed down the airflow. Right? This is all kind of compounding one another. If you look at a car engine, you can't just take the carburetor off, throw it off, wrap this and put it on, expect it to run perfectly. It's going to have, then that's that carburetor that's been designed for that engine because that engine's so complex today. You've got modules here and modules there and it's computerized. You screw it all up. The house is the same way. If you just say, okay, I'm going to replace the windows, that's good, that's a good thing. I heard that was good. Or I'm going to insulate the walls, that was a good thing. Or maybe my attic, I'm going to throw some insulation in there, someone told me that was a good thing I should do. It's all good things to do. Just you don't want to do that first. Because if you don't do the air sealing, then you've actually just kind of, it's like putting on your shoes before putting on the socks. Then you realize you've got to put the socks on, so you've got to take the shoe back off. Yeah. Um, what about uh, attic exhaust fans versus insulation or in addition to insulation or maybe you don't want an attic <coughs> fan because of its, um, you know, leakage and so on? Air fans are fine. Air yeah. attic fans? Yeah, they're fine. Um, you don't want to, it's not like, it's not a replacement for insulation. Um, it's, it's, a, it's like it's a supplement to insulation. You still want to insulate. But before you insulate, you want to air seal. So in this chart, after low cost, no cost, it would be air sealing. And at that point, you want to address the shell of the building, the floor, the ceiling, and four walls. Make that building energy efficient. Once you make the building energy efficient, now you can start looking at, well, so I downsize that oversized HVAC system. Well, you don't necessarily have to, but it's going to cost more money to operate. And if it costs more money to operate and it's working harder, it's going to break down faster. So now I've got to repair costs sooner rather than later. So it's just, there's just a compounding matter if you don't address them in the order that needs to be addressed in. <clears throat> now, we've never addressed them in this way. This is all new for everybody. If you've been training in the building science, you kind of understand, you've got a little bit of construction experience, you kind of start to understand what's going on. But if you don't, <clears throat> we've all known to uh, you know, get a good window. Dual pane windows, good, great, right? With argon gas and low E. That's all I know. Well, if the U factor on that window is 0.33 versus a 0.28, I'm going to 0.33, I'm going to stand in the front of the window, the sun's going to come through the window, and I'm going to feel the heat from the sun. That's heat transfer. That's not good. Because that heat transfer, that heat, 
is creating BTUs that I now have to have an HVAC system cool down, right? So I'm not hot. But if I get a 0.28 or a 0.26, now that same window I stand in front of it with the sun beating down on me, I got the sun on me, but I don't feel the heat. Now I don't have any heat transfer. Now I can downsize that HVAC system, and when I do so, I'm not having to make it work so hard. Find out what's going on. So yeah, you can put windows in, but did you put the right windows in? You can put insulation in, but just put it in enough. And did you air seal before you did so? And 90% of the time, you go talk to an HVAC system guy or an insulation company, and they're not going to mention anything about airflow. They're not even going to be in part of their lexicon because they're not trained in building science. They're going to have to be if they want to continue installing HVAC systems and working on them after 2020 because you're not going to go into a zero net energy home and just swap out some HVAC system because you're going to affect other items, especially when you get up in the attic and it's got a blanket of insulation up there that's blown in 18 inches high and the ducts are buried. And he's going to go up there and replace the furnace. But he's going to trap all over that insulation. If he does that, he just knocked off 50% of the R value. Is he going to fix it now that he did? Probably not. Do you know to tell him to fix it? No. So, you know, that's you know, this is all the things around building science that we're going to learn going forward. And you don't have to have it in trial by error, but <clears throat> this is, you know, someone like myself can help guide you or someone in my capacity. And that way you can understand what's going on. And an energy audit can tell you all this. You can have someone do an energy audit for you, and they'll tell you what your insulation looks like, tell you what's going on, <clears throat> and they'll instruct you, if they're doing the job properly, that if anybody goes up in that attic after insulating it, and they walk all over it and lose 50% of the R value, that you just paid for, then uh, you're going to want them to you know, fix it. You're going to want someone to tell you that, hey, they did this. And you're going to want to know about it. You want to know that that's what you need to be looking for. Question? Yeah. So you had windows at the top of that pyramid, but then you also were talking about air sealing and those two things being related. Um, well, not really. No. Air sealing <coughs> dresses the airflow in the building, right? So I got all this airflow moving like this. I just plugged the hole up in that cup, now it's doing this. Well, if it's doing this, the amount of air that I just heated, it's doing this, and I heat the air up, how fast am I leaving? Pretty quickly. Now, if I slow down and I, and I pressurize the house, and I do this, now how long is that air leaving? How long is the HVAC system staying off? A lot longer than it is today. So now I've just saved money just by air sealing. I didn't even touch the windows on the insulation yet. I haven't downsized the HVAC system yet. All that is just been, just by air sealing, I've reduced my energy use. But if I'm going to start using that energy, or start using like the appliances, uh, like the, 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 the HVAC system, the furnace, the water heater, that's going to start using energy. And the HVAC system particularly, is going to want to uh, heat and cool the house and be able to put the BTUs necessary to heat and cool that house. And if it's only running, for, it's taking eight minutes or so to heat the place down or heat the place up or cool it down, then that's what it's going to do because there's too much, too many BTUs in that small space. I got airflow moving this fast. I don't need a, a, a five-ton air conditioning system. I can use a two-ton air conditioning system in the same space. So how do you balance that with enough ventilation to prevent mildew, mold and mold? Well, first off, the ventilation from the HVAC system, that's what the V stands for is ventilation, right? Uh, in order for an HVAC system to operate at whatever rate of efficiency it is, it's an 80%, 16% sear, or 96% efficient furnace, and a 16 sear air conditioner, in order for it to run at 80% or 96% or whatever that efficiency is, it has to run for 15 minutes. I'm a Hertz Raider. When mechanical guys go out there and replace your HVAC system, a Hertz Raider got to come out there and verify so you get a permit signed off. That Hertz Raider has to wait 15 minutes for that HVAC system to run. Why? Because it gets, takes 15 minutes for that HVAC system to get to its steady state, where it's running at its optimal efficiency. Now, as a Hertz Raider, I can test the refrigerant flow, make sure uh, that's charged properly. I can make sure the airflow in the system is working properly and all that. But I can't test that, but it's only been running for eight minutes. But if you go time your HVAC system in your own homes, you're going to see they're going to go off for maybe eight minutes and go off for ten. So you got a system in your house that may be oversized that's running for eight minutes. Now if you plug up that system you know, through the air sealing and 
<clears throat> use that same system to heat that same amount of airflow, you don't have that amount of airflow anymore. That system is put in because you have airflow looking like this. Now that you've got airflow looking like this, you don't need that big old tiny system. Now you can downsize it. But if you don't, not only will you not ventilate the house property because it, in order to get to the rate of efficiency, and ventilate properties it's got to run for 15 minutes more than running half that time. So there's, we're, already, we're already short on you know ventilation. Now, if you air seal and get too tight, which I think where you're going with this, is that's an impossibility. I mean, think about it. You're never going to get the house zero energy, zero airflow, right? It's never going to get there. You can do a lot of things, but you're going to spend a fortune doing it. So no one's going to go that far. So your house is never going to be that tight. But you are going to have you are going to have enough time, or enough energy to. Um, Thought. When you get the house too tight, I'm running out of time, guys. When you get the, when you get the uh, tire too, uh, the airflow too tight, there's mechanical ventilation, right? So if I got you down to one air chain per hour, could you be good? That'd be a good thing. I can put mechanical ventilation and bring you back up to four, which is where I want you to be, right? So you're never going to have the mold issues by getting yourself too tight. Yeah, if we can keep our uh, questions to them because we got 30 minutes to do questions, so we'll have plenty of time. Okay, now I told you there's taxes and the wells. Yes, sir. I have a question. I understand your process. Yeah, all right. You would now do the lighting first. Yes. So uh, EPA is against that. The first thing they do is to replace the lighting because that reduces the heat load. The next thing they do is to tune the building. That's just like your car. If you don't tune, uh, tune your building and then you install an overdrive, it's not going to work. The third step is, then they will, now you know what the load is. Now they will look at the HVAC system, <coughs> heating, ventilating, and air conditioning system. And then they go to uh, insulate the building before, but lighting is the first thing. Tuning of the building is the next thing. Right, well, tuning up the building and using lighting, when you want to tune up that building, you want to slow down your airflow. You want to slow down the airflow before you do anything. Lighting, tuning, HVAC system, insulation, windows, appliances, refrigerators give off heat. So, I mean, there's lighting a, gives, it's gives the BTUs. Heat. Basically, what you're looking at doing is re reducing the BTUs necessary to heat or cool the house or that unit. And that's what you do by lighting, correct? Yeah, it does. If you do that, if you put it down a date. An incandescent light is considerably hotter correct. than an LED. Correct. That's why they're getting dialed. Right. Nothing you said is wrong. What is different, I'm trying to say, is that if you don't address your airflow first before you do all that other stuff, you're kind of missing the point. Well, it's interesting that EPA and a whole bunch of other engineers uh, no, the engineers were actually telling you to air seal. I, I would like to see that engineer. I will get you the information. Yeah. I, I would appreciate it. That would be perfect. Yeah, because actually, isn't the air flowing constantly? You don't have to turn on. Yeah, keep in mind, you got three to five air changes per hour. That means for three times to five times an hour, the volume of air in this room is exchanging. So I got all the air leaving, new air coming in, three to five times. That's when all the time the light is a good point, but you're not using it unless you flick it on. Well, that's true, but you still got airflow, but right? So it's constant, and that's why you address it. First. So what happens when you heat this house? They heat the house 70 degrees, 70 degrees. You got air moving out. I got cold air coming in. What happens to cold air meets that 70 degree air? Cools it down. Now, for that air, after a certain amount of time, what's going to happen? The air is going to get down to the level where the step point kicks on, kicks on the air conditioning system. Right? So now the air conditioning got to kick on to cool down that house, cool down this room again, so that the temperature of all of our bodies doesn't, you know, make us feel stuffy and icky. Right? So what's changed? What's, what's stopping that? How do you get that HVAC system to go from eight minutes to fifteen minutes? How? Air seal. Air seal. So, but how is lighting stopping that? See, lighting is still putting heat into no, the building. It's not stopping. It's not stopping. It's, it's adding point, to it. But if you've never touched yeah. the lights at all for the entire day, you still got that air moving through. 
and that HVAC system we've got the set point set is still going to kick on. So how long does that HVAC system stay on? How long? Because it's got to run for 15 minutes. So how are you going to get to run for 15 minutes and then stay off for 20? By slowing down that airflow. And once you've done that, now you're going to address all those other issues. Can I continue your presentation? We can debate this all day. But if you continue your presentation, we can hear the rest of it. Yes. Can we move Thank on? You. Yeah, please. <clears throat> Okay, so uh, there are two things. One of them is the $45 tax credit. Uh, that gave you $2,000 per unit if you meet the uh, IETCC standards for 2006. Now, if you think about Title 24, our 2008 standard for Title 24 met this particular standard. Um, and so all you need to do is just kind of reduce the, we're going back to heating and cooling loads, not heating and cooling systems. We're not talking about replacing your HVAC system. It's a 50 percent better system. We're talking about reducing the buildings, BTUs, and reducing that by 50 percent. That's where the airflow comes in, the air sealing, downsizing the HVAC system, replacing the lighting, and all that. That helps get us to that point. The other thing is, and this is very relevant to you guys, is that sometimes it doesn't take that much to get that unit. And we're only talking about a single unit. Now you might have 20 of them, but I just need to look at one. And if one of them is better uh, than 50%, there's a $2,000 tax credit. Maybe unit two doesn't have it, maybe unit three does. Or maybe they all do, because you've done the same thing to all the units. And maybe you've mixed and matched, you know, lighting in one unit, an HVAC system in another unit, or replacing of a condensing unit and lighting in a third unit. You didn't do this become energy efficient. You didn't do this for the $2,000 tax credit. It was a regular maintenance expense. The thing broke. The window cracked. The lights went out. I just replaced it. I had no idea I could get a two thousand dollar tax credit up because now that I've done that, my building has uh, that, well, that unit has now reduced the BTU loads, the heating and cooling loads, and that only is as much BTUs now to heat and cool that place. And that's where uh, an, an energy audit comes in and they analyze that building and that, 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 that unit. But that's found in the 45 volt tax credit. Um, and that started in 2005, and it went on to, uh, you know, been up and down, up and down, it's been exp uh, um, expired, and it's renewed, and expired, and renewed. And that's expired in 2017, so anybody from 2015 through 2017 can go back and capture that tax credit. Um, but, and Congress has just done a study that said, all of the uh, uh, had done a study that said they want to put the, put the tax extenders, and that's the um, you've all heard about the tax extenders. They want to renew that permanently, and now make it you know so that it expires and it gives everybody some kind of, of uh, consistency. The other one is for is 179D. Um, this does everything for either commercial space, high rises, or common areas on your low uh, low rise residential. Um, <clears throat> doesn't take much. Um, we're looking at reducing the heating and cooling loads by 15% of the HVAC system, 25% for lighting, and 10% for uh, the envelope, which could be windows or insulation. Uh, again, you need somebody to come out and assess the, the unit, the property, to make sure that it's doing it. There's software we use to uh, to analyze this to tell you whether or not you get your native work. But once it does, the, uh, the savings are there. It's 60% for heating. 60% uh, for lighting and 60% for um, for the envelope for a total of dollar eighty. And if you guys want, we can give you a, a, a copy of this uh, slide. These are federal tax codes or state? Yeah, federal. federal. Is it just for commercial or residential? Both. High rise um, and um, commercial, as well as low rise uh, common area. So what about, what about single family or multi? No single family, but the multi is low rise. Low rise uh, common areas like laundry rooms or uh, community centers or manager offices, that kind of thing. <clears throat> now here's an example of, I was talking earlier about the cost. <clears throat> I'm assuming here, <clears throat> I've got 26 units, uh, 900 square feet. I don't know what the total volume is off the top. I've uh, <clears throat> made all my energy efficiency improvements. 
and I now have increased my uh, net operating income by 35 cents per square foot. Um, and my cap rate that I've already figured out is 5%. So I just spent 20 grand on this upgrading this unit, and I qualify for the $2,000 tax credit. Um, I'm using this tax credit because it's more likely going to be renewed, and so it's going to become relevant. So I got a $2,000 tax credit on the kid after I spend this 20 grand. I'm going to take a depreciation. I assume an average of 10% um, for uh, a 10 year maker. So it's just, it's just because of all the different types of depreciation schedules we have, I just kind of use that one. And so I'm going to say that we get another two grand off of that. Asset disposition, get up to 30% off the cost of what you spent. Now, not as much what you spent, but what you threw away. This is my window, and I just took it out, put a new one in. What did I do with my window? I threw it away. No good. But and I spent five, I spent a thousand bucks, put a new window in. But this now has a dollar value. I don't know how much it is. I bought the building with it in it, and so it's part of the whatever the price I purchased. So and I didn't do a cost of education test study that told me, oh, that window's only you know five hundred bucks. So what I do is I use that thousand dollars and I work my way backwards, figuring out well, it's twenty years old. I work my way backwards and I figure out the value of that old window, you know, it's 400 bucks. I can deduct that $400. Now that $1,000 window just cost me 700 bucks or 600 bucks because I got a $400 deduction off the old window. Prior to 2012, we just tossed it in the trash and forgot about it. Kept our depreciation schedules as is. Now I can deduct not only the $400,000, $400, but I can back out the depreciation for just the window. So if I ever go to sell a building and I got to recapture my depreciation, I just say 400 bucks or 300 bucks or whatever the prior depreciation is on the window. And that's the same for capital gains, unless you would like kind of change. So that's what uh, asset disposition does for you. And it averages about 30% of what you actually expect. So there's uh, the, uh, you know, another six. And then, of course, if you take your net operating income per square foot and you divide that by your cap rate, that'll give you a per square foot valuation on your property increase, which means your property will increase. Five, um, I use five here, but a 6% uh, increase with the same amount of money over the net operating income is a $5.83 increase per square foot. Now, if I had 26 times 900, I think it's like 30,000 square feet, somewhere in that neighborhood. And if I multiply that by, say, round that up to six, I'm not going to have $180,000. But I didn't spend $180,000. Yeah, I had a question. How many tax men know this? All of them. They should know In it. fact, if they haven't told you anything about this and you made improvements, see, you know there are some of the improvements that the, the tax credits, they know about them, they've expired, so they're probably not mentioning it. The asset disposition of being able to take that old window down and deduct it, that they know about. And if you've done that and they haven't told you about it, you can go back to the IRS and amend your return, and the IRS has already said that if your, IRS, if your accountant knows you've made the improvement but didn't tell you about the deduction, you can go back and get it. Because ideally, you're supposed to take it in the year you make the deduction. So if you did an deduction in 2017 but didn't take this deduction, and just not finding out about it, you can go back to 2016 or 17 on your return, amend that return, and take that deduction. Now, even though you didn't take the deduction during the, in 2017 like you were supposed to, but then again, you count to the book of that. I'm out of time, so I'm going to go through this real quick. And uh, um, these are some of the conservation measures. Air soon is the first one. You want to start looking at insulation after that, and then you want to start addressing your lighting. Um, each fact system is, is okay. You can do it here. It's a good time to do it, but you can also start looking at appliances, uh, windows are part of the shell, pull pumps, and low flow fixtures, or eh, you can do those later. Um, water heaters, another one. Um, I'm, at, I'm running out of time here, guys. I got to get in some time, so I got to speed this up a little bit. Um, Here's the personal property with a $400 window of deduction. I just, I just explained. You're able to write down your disposed assets. That old window that came out, disposed asset. That old HVAC system that broke down and replaced, that's an old disposed asset. Uh, start thinking about what you just did to maintain your property. 
they just threw something away because it was broken and you paid for a new one. In all likelihood, if you did all this after 2012, you have yourself a deduction. So you can go back to how far, you can go back to your, to your tax return, figure out what all you did, see if it's worth going back. Because if it, for anything you do prior to today, to what, 2018's tax returns, is a refund. So anything you paid prior, any deductions you get out of that is, is, is a refund coming back to you, and you've got two, three years worth of it, then there's two, three years worth of refunds, just depending on how much you spent and what the dollar value is and what you replaced that you were able to deduct. Um, <clears throat> so dates are, uh, you know, in 1978, 1978, we were put in R11. That's the first year we started mandating that we insulate our walls. In 78, we were also doing R19 in the attic. So we've got any older buildings that haven't been approved since then. You started with R19, likely today you probably got R6 if you haven't touched it. Uh, in 91, we were doing crawl spacing. Before that, they didn't have any insulation. In 92, we upped uh, all wall insulation from 11 to 13. Um, if you haven't got any wall insulation, they come in on the inside mostly. They drill a hole to fill up that bay for the next one, next stud. Drill a hole, fill up that bay. They use cellulose. It's not costly. Um, probably some of the neighborhood are about maybe about 80. Per square foot wall area. They'd say a wall. And you only do make sugars. Um, <clears throat> heating and cooling efficiency. So usually we have 80% efficient systems in there. They need to run for 15 minutes to actually operate at 80% efficiency, because we all know that we operate by maybe eight minutes. That's about 53%. You divide eight into 15. So you apply 53% to that 80% efficiency rating, and you really only got a 43% efficient system. So if you have air seal, get the building where it's supposed to be, get the right size HVAC system in there, you will have an 80% efficiency. <coughs> and like I said about the sun, if you can feel the sun through the window, you got a time, it's time to replace the window where you've got a bad window. Um, <clears throat> this looks familiar. Uh, you can increase your rental rates by going to zero energy. You can reduce your common area expenses. Uh, you increase your first square foot valuations. Uh, your tenants are going to be happy, so they're not going to be moving. Uh, so your vacancy rates drop, and you have happy tenants who are saying, hey, you shouldn't live in my place. <coughs> uh, benchmarking. Starting in 2018, you have to benchmark, actually, I think 2017, you have to benchmark the building if your building is 50,000 square feet or bigger. Not cumulative, individual buildings. We have five buildings that are 5,000 square feet, you don't got to do it. You got five buildings that are 10,000 square feet, you don't got to do it. But if you got five buildings that are 50,000 square feet each, each one of them have to happen. So the building itself has to be 50,000 or more, or you don't have to worry about benchmarking. However, if you don't, benchmarking helps you identify what your energy use is in the buildings you do have. So it's kind of like if you don't know what you don't, if you don't know it's broken, how can you fix it? This helps you figure out whether or not it's broken and where you're at and helps you manage it. And managing electricity today is something we need to all start doing. We didn't have to do it before, but now it's kind of time. Um, <clears throat> these are just uh, um, some of the benefits. Uh, energy efficient living, it's less costly. Um, it's putting money back in my pocket as a tenant. I'm more comfortable in the house. Um, I'm not moving. Why? If I go anywhere else, likelihood of them being a zero in energy home is going to be remote, remote unless um, after 2020 I'm moving into a brand new unit that was just built in 2020 or sometime before that or after that. Okay? Um, so we want to make sure we take care of that. And you want to be in there because when you go to sell this property or take out uh, money, you're going to want to say, they're, they're going to do a comp. They're going to say, well, what's your property value at? You know, what, how do you compare to your neighbors? Well, you're not going to, if you're on zero net energy and your neighbor's not, and he just sold his property or his property's got a certain amount of, you know, valuation to it, that's not a comp. It's nowhere close to what you're like. So your comps are going to be those brand new zero net energy homes and apartments. And those are going to be where your comps are going to be. And those are going to be a lot more valuable than the ones that haven't done anything. So that's money in your pocket when you increase your valuation of your property because you pull out equity, but when you go to sell the property, that's all money, paper money right now, it's still money. 
Um, again, wall to wall comfort when we're doing it, um, after being zero net energy. And at this time, I'd like to reintroduce McKen. Thank you for your time. Let's give my brother a round of applause. Okay, so in regards to solar, uh, one of the things that it's really important that you start with energy efficiency measures. Uh, Mark gave a really good presentation on what we need to do first, and then what we do is then we look into the solar. Now, the thing is, is like Mark was saying, stating earlier, uh, it's going to probably uh, reduce by what 30 percent, 30 to 40 percent, and of course the solar part will reduce the rest of it, 60%. And of course, you got battery storage as, as well that you can do. And the thing is, is the first thing that I recommend uh, uh, property owners to do is definitely start up with uh, uh, doing energy efficiency, solar, and consider as well uh, battery storage if you need it for backup as well. Because one of the things that battery storage can do for you is as arbitrage, so when you get demand charges, you can shave that as well. So we reduce the demand shaving, and also you can use it for arbitrage, where you're selling it at uh, peak demand times and buying it at really low, kind of like stocks. But anyway, so let's go ahead and start here in regards to how does net metering work in solar for multifamily units? Well, basically you have your solar, you have your inverters, which converts the solar into energy. Uh, and then, of course, what's going to happen is you have a, a new meter, which is a net metering that goes forward and backwards. So that's where you buy energy at the evening time, right? And, uh, and then you sell it during the day. Now, the thing is, is that for family uh, you know, units, you can do a virtual net metering with all your tenants if you wanted to, and, of course, with your common meters. And you can have the solar system for the entire community if you wanted to. Now the thing is, is do you have enough rooftop space? Do you, if you, if you have enough parking space to put carports? Those are issues that we, we would talk to you about. And you can reduce uh, as much as possible after energy efficiency, you can try to reduce your whole usage as well. Now, in regards to uh, the expense of solar. We all know that our rates are going up every year. It goes up 5%, 10%, 7%, it changes. We don't have the slightest idea what our rate's gonna be every year, are we? So, what you do is you get solar, because with solar, it's dependable, and you know exactly what you'll be paying every year, and also you will own that power plant. So is there funding for projects like this for property owners? Yes, and, I, I, and I'll talk about that as well. So the, the thing is, is of course, our utility companies don't like us solar guys because one of the things is we're stealing our customers. But they should love us because we're also becoming the power plant for PG&E or, or your utility company because now we're creating energy for them because what you don't use during the day, well, you have to, to send that that, you, that energy somewhere and you send it back to the utility company and you're selling it back at a certain rate. So uh, they, the thing is, is that uh, pg e for instance, in Northern California, they haven't really built any new power plants. They don't need to. It's because of solar and wind as well. All right, so in, in regards to defining your, your uh, energy, consumption, well, that's part of uh, what Mark will do is he'll evaluate your your, your, uh, your energy use, and then he'll he'll let me know and he'll say, hey, you need this size kilowatt system to offset their needs. And that's where we both come in together, working together to uh, decide what size system, solar system you need. Most solar companies, what they'll do is they're, they're not going to go through this process of what Mark and I are doing. Uh, they're just going to give uh, offset 100% of everything. So in, uh, your, your solar system is going to probably double. You don't need a huge solar system if you can do energy efficiency first. And of course, uh, I just talked about this earlier, uh, energy consumption minus renewable energy equals zero net energy. 
and that's what that zero energy is about. Now, I, like I was talking about earlier on, on this chart, is it worth going solar? Well, yes. Doesn't it make sense, guys, to own your own power plant? It really does. Because the thing is, is you own that, that energy. You know that you have the predictability of knowing exactly what you'd be paying. And so here, this chart here shows you the old electric bill, uh, the new electric bill, and the thing is, is that it depends on how much rooftop space, how much car uh, parking that's available. Now, are there incentives? There's huge incentives, especially for uh, property owners. You got your tax credits. And the thing is, is the, the ICC uh, tax credit is gonna be expiring down from 30% to 26% at the end of this year. But Congress, which is, uh, you know, <laughs> slowing down the progress of, uh, you know, giving rebates and credits out there, they, they're gonna consider extending the, the ICC uh, tax credit, we hope, because it's a bipartisan uh, issue that benefits both sides. So if that does pass, they're going to make it permanent, like just like Mark was saying. But if it doesn't, then it's going to go, go down to 26%, and then the following year it's going to go to 24%, and then it's going to go all the way to 10%. Now the thing is, is that you also have incentives with depreciation. You got federal and state depreciation. You get to depreciate all that. Homeowners do not. Property owners do. Now, are there rebates? Yeah, there's rebates for battery storage. There's no rebates anymore through pg &E. That was over a few years ago. And the thing is, this is gonna be benefit your common areas, it's gonna benefit your tenants. So if you wanna get uh, a solar system for your whole community, you can do that. And you can do it with virtual <coughs> metering. And uh, talk to me after, afterwards, and we can talk more about how you can do that for your community as well. So. The direct savings of the energy produced by your renewable system, the thing is, is that it's going to benefit. Now, four basic models of energy development. Now, there's several ways of funding. Now, you get your PACE program. These are all no, no upfront programs, okay? PACE, which is the Property Assessed Clean Energy Program that's here actually throughout the whole United States. And that's available based on your the assessment of your property. So if you have a, uh, equity on your property, you qualify. And the thing is, is many property owners don't want to use their credit. They don't want to get a lease. They don't want to get a loan. So we get a PACE loan. And so you pay it during your tax assessments. And I'll talk more about that later as well. Uh, so that is available. And then the nice thing about PACE is that all the energy efficiency items that Mark is talking about in HVAC, LED, the walls, and the, the ceiling, everything, all those items can be funded by PACE. You have a great way here, guys, to get funded at no cost up front. And the thing is, is with the PACE program, you don't pay it until 18 months later. So you should check into this, uh, the, the PACE program. All right, now, the other way of funding is capital lease. Now, capital lease is the same thing as a loan. But what a capital lease really is, it's just a short-term loan five, seven, or 10 years. And there's, there's a funding that's available for you if you just want a short-term loan. Now, a lease, which is a true operating lease. Of course, many of you have uh, maybe leased a copy machine or leased a piece of equipment. Well, this is a true lease just like that. So instead of purchasing uh, the solar system, let someone else purchase it and you just lease it. You get the 100% uh, write-off every, every month on that payment. So it's no capital investment. No. That's another way. If you don't have the tax appetite to use the federal tax credits, the depreciation, or anything else, you go with a lease. And you can do that. You can write it off. It's an expense, and especially for, uh, for property owners. This, uh, I have many clients that have done that. Now, a PPA, which is, which is a power purchase agreement, well, the thing is, we all enter into a power purchase agreement, right? With uh, PG&E or a utility company. But it's indefinitely. We pay whatever they tell us, right? Now here, with a power purchase agreement, with a solar power purchase agreement, you know exactly what you'd be paying every month, every year, for up to 20 years or 25 years. You don't own it. It's, uh, if you don't have the tax appetite, you want to go with a power purchase agreement. 
don't try costs, it's not your equipment, you have to maintain it. All you're doing is purchasing electricity. And you do that, you can do that with single homes, you can do that with multi-family homes and commercial business. There's power versus green incentive available as well. Now, how many people here have uh, Section 8 housing? Okay, we've got a couple here, right? Yeah. You're gonna like this. Okay, so the SOMA, which is a Solar on Multifamily Affordable South, uh, Solar Housing Program, if you guys go to this website, uh, calsoma.org, take a picture, this is really important. You have the opportunity to get solar for your, for your uh, complex, for your apartment complex, at no cost to you, period. It's not a loan, it's funding, that's, they, they have a billion dollar funding, I don't know exactly what it is, but it's, there's allocation of money every year that's available for you apartment owners. If you want solar, then you apply. Does yeah. the whole property have to be Section 8 or only certain units? That, that's a good question. So uh, for Section 8, there's a, there's a qualification here, and I think I mentioned this here. I think it has to be based, uh, based uh, on 60% of the uh, area medium income. And I believe it's either 60 or 80% uh, of your property has to be low income. The rest, but there's a, there is a there is a qualification. But that's available for uh, for you as well. Now, uh, like I, of course, there's cash. Cash is king, right? I I I think I went through everything here. Now the thing is, uh, what we just presented here today is really, really important information. And this is your opportunity today to make a difference as property owners, uh, as, as uh, people to make, make a change in the state of California to go zero net energy. And the thing is, like Mark stated earlier, uh, starting in 2020, it's all new homes. Uh, it's all uh, multifamily homes that are under three stories or less. But by 2030, between 2020 and 2030, it's 50% of existing uh, homes and, and residential multifamily homes and commercial. So uh, you can make the difference by making, uh, <clears throat> making this opportunity without having to fund all these projects out of your pocket. There's funding that's available. And really, there's really no excuse because this is gonna save you money. This, the whole program is gonna save you money. You're gonna own your power plants. That's the reason why you, you see many, many people are getting solar systems. You see, uh, you see the uh, uh, school districts all getting carports. So you see everyone that's coming around, you, you see all these solar systems because they're not paying for it. They're getting a tax equity investor to fund it with a PPA or with a lease. Same thing can happen with you guys. All right, so uh, I, I guess I have time for, we have for questioning and answering. Okay. Yes, uh, if you have a question, why don't you go ahead and fall in line over here, this mic over here. So, if you have questions, you can. What is the reference for the um, box? Is it a, um, is it a, a sense of bill? Can you give us the reference so we can read the content of it? Yeah. yeah, and what we're going to do, guys, as well, is we're going to go ahead and uh, send you a PowerPoint, okay, and, and we'll have that information for you as well. So we'll, we'll give you references as well, okay? It's With, following AB32. It's following along AB32. AB32? Yeah. Thank you. Right. And, and does that only, does that five units, is that 2030? If it's for 2030, it's existing. Yeah, if, if it's brand new, yes. So if, if you have five units, it's uh, and it's brand new, it's 2020. But but the thing is, if it's uh, existing, uh, it's by 2030. Yeah. Questions? Yes. Can you uh, give us some detail about uh, virtual metering thing? Yeah. Or multi yeah. So uh, you got aggregated metering and you got virtual net metering. The thing is, is that if you want to convert your apartment to solar for the whole complex, you would need to have a sub meter for each 
tenant, right? And what you can do is you can use virtual net metering to interconnect everything together. So if you have 20 units or 100 units, use vir virtual net metering to be able to allocate uh, kilowatt usage. So say for instance, uh, uh, the solar system is gonna produce 100,000 kilowatt hours and you have 100 units, what you're gonna do is say for instance, you're gonna divide it and say, allocate to each unit 500 kilowatt uh, units of solar into each individual meter. And that's where the virtual net metering comes in. So you can do that. Well, I, I can talk more about it later as well. Yes? If you have under 50,000 square feet of your total rental properties, then this does not uh, apply. I don't know. I, I, I don't quite know. I didn't if, get it. If the individual building is less than 50, it doesn't apply. It's individual buildings. One building under 50,000. One building under 50,000 does not apply. Okay. Thank One you. building over 50,000. Right. Right. But didn't you say it would 50% of it? They're trying to make that the goals. Well, well that's, that's different. She's talking about benchmark too. Oh. But yeah, going to zero net energy, is a, they're trying to get 50% of existing buildings zero net energy. Right. Mark, can you give uh, some examples of uh, air sealing? Uh, you know, aside from weather stripping doors, etc. Right. What do you mean by air sealing? Air sealing is at the top of the building. So basically, it's two things. If you're at a flat roof, you're a little difficult. You've got vaulted seating; those are hard. <clears throat> but uh, depending on it, it depends on how much you're going to spend and how much money you're leveraging. But you can do it in the attic. Take a typical attic. You're going around the perimeter wall with the top plate, where the top plate, where the top plate meets the chipping uh, um, board or the ceiling. Right there in that little corner, you put a bead of foam. You guess where the air is leaking out. And it's going to go around the exact the existing building on the exterior walls, and then on either side of the interior walls, uh, we can put a bead of foam. And then they look at the top plate and put back in the older buildings. <coughs> we did, um, uh, we drilled holes in the top plate. We had wires and piping, and we didn't plug them up. So those get plugged up. Uh, junction boxes, the ceiling fans, recessed lighting. Anything that penetrates in the conditioned space gets sealed. If you've got recessed lighting and it's not airtight, it's got to be replaced because you can't bury that insulation in the insulation because it gets too hot and it causes a fire. So you got to make sure you got airtight cans. Before you do any of this, <coughs> excuse me, and that's how you get to plug up the, into the air sealer. That's with an attic. Now, if you've got any kind of space between that and the flat roof, assuming you have a flat roof, then you can get it there from the inside, and you can plug that up, or you can go just where the wall meets the ceiling, and you can do that from the inside, and just do some caulking, some small clear caulking, and that matches the paint. If you do it. Uh, with paint that mat or cock that matches the color, you know, the eyeball will see it reflect, so you won't even know it's there. And that's your book. Um, that's the yeah. one. Uh, in the crawl space? Seal, yeah. If you cannot get to the attic area or to the roof, but you do have a crawl space, that would be another spot. Um, but that's like a last resort, right? But you're still going to have that airflow coming in. So you're not necessarily going to pressurize it, but you're going to slow it down. And that's the issue. All we're trying to do here is slow down that airflow. However you can get that done, easiest is down on the top. You know, if you can plug up the whole nest out of the cup, so to speak, and pressurize that house or that room, now you've got uh, less BTUs you need to heat and cool the place. So are you saying not to have solid vents? Solid vents have nothing to do with it. That's up in the attic and right. to, to clear the attic. Attic fans are irrelevant. Okay. Uh, you so can this actually is below it. the attic. Right. Okay. Right. Because right now, if you look at your attic floor, if you look at a typical attic, you've got the ceiling, and your gypsum board, and you've got your top plate, which your walls come up, and then you've got your attic, which you've seen here. Yeah. What's the incentive for a property owner, with a Class C building, multi-unit, that's getting top market rent, with no air conditioning, wall heaters, and, uh, and uh, upgraded windows? What's the incentive? To, to go with this. This will work. We're not getting top rent. I get you. I okay. get you. And, uh, You've got it all dialed in. I got it. <laughs> there, there's no incentive. Uh, uh, if I'm living in your. Okay. Um, there's a housing crunch. Maybe I'm a tenant in your building. I'm paying what you're asking um, because it's close to work or wherever, whatever my reason is. Yeah. Uh, and I'm suffering through the heat. 
you're in the Bay Area, right? So theoretically, we think, hey, the ocean, the cool breeze, cool things down, we don't need AC too much. We're putting AC in San Francisco. Nobody puts AC in San Francisco. We do today. Oakland, AC air conditioning. And we want to be comfortable. So maybe you're getting top dollar, and that guy's not doing, you know, um, give him an opportunity, give him an option. Would that, stay? Would that same tenant stay if you had to do the same thing, same rent, same unit, only he has AC? Yeah, At least more comfortable. I, I All things being equal. Yeah. But it's not a major incentive for a property owner. Well, your property goes up. Well, I'm not going to put up. AC in a Class C building, okay? It's not going to do it. Okay, and, that's fine. Uh, you don't have to. And so, and then sealing it up, uh, they get they get window fans, and I don't have any problem renting the place. Is people knocking on the door to rent? So I just don't get it to do what you're talking about for a commercial building that is well, more entry level. Now you're talking about a B or A building. You're probably going to do that because you get a higher grade of tenant, and and then and they're more discriminating and they shop. But a person that's shopping for a Class C building is looking for a roof on his head and hopefully get a parking space. Well, that's true. So, yeah, uh, and if anybody in the room that has a Class C building, you know what I'm talking about. So, so what you're just saying is, so what's the value of the building? Does it matter? It's, uh, well, the value of the building is how much money you can make on it, okay? Right, that's right. What, that's what the value right. of the building is, income property. So is these low-income housing properties? I can get the same amount with no air conditioning as I can with air conditioning. And I'm not going to put AC in the building. It's just too... It's too costly. It's too costly. It doesn't make sense. All right. So, and, so, so your question is, is why do you need to do this, right? Yeah. Well, in my instance... In your instance? Yes. Now, okay. I've got another property that is an A building, and right. it makes total sense That's what you're talking about. about. Right. So... Wow. So, um, you know, uh, well, uh, Mark, why don't you explain how benchmarking started and then how, how it's mandatory now? And compare that to well, yeah, what it doesn't apply to him because he doesn't have a 50,000 square foot bill. Yeah, I, I understand that. But uh, in regards to how zero net energy Basically, what we're is, trying to do here with zero net energy is reduce our carbon emissions, period. How we do that, this is one way. So, even though you got a Class C, and if you can do lighting, you can do windows, you're going, to, yeah. you're going to reduce the BTUs needed to heat and cool the place. Maybe you don't put AC in, because if you put in AC, you're adding electricity use, right? That's right. So maybe you go electrification. There's a big push for electrification. Getting rid of gas all together. Putting everything electric. And then putting solar on top of that. Think about this. you got a Class C building. You're getting top dollar, whatever top dollar is. Guess what? You do that with that. I went to the city of San Jose. I wanted to put in electric based for it. Can't do it. Okay? It's inefficient. It is. Okay. But now you're talking power 24. So, so that's a whole matter you got to meet. Just you have to have a wall heater. I want to get yes. rid of my wall heaters and put in electric based for it. Uh huh. It's more, it, it, it uses more energy. Put something else in. Put in a heat pump. Put in a mini spit. Okay, but you're saying. You want to go to electricity because that's the goal. Everything be electricity. Get rid of the gas. That's one of them, yeah. Yeah. I mean, electrification is, is an option. I know. Yeah. I know. And you're in a, you're in a kind of a unique sense because you're not a, you're not the norm in the multifamily. Yeah, I think there's other guys like me in the room here. I'm not saying there's yeah. not other people. Yeah. 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 Oh, uh, yeah. uh, before yeah. I forget, make sure you guys pull this out and give this to Allison if you want your your assessment. This is a fifteen hundred dollar value, so make sure you give this to Allison, all right? What is class A building? Class A. Could you define class A building? Yeah, could you define that? I, I, I'm sorry, I didn't quite hear you. Could you define what is class, class C building? building? A class A building is uh, something down at San Jose State, 11th Street, 10th Street, North 6th Street. Uh, okay, no air conditioning. Okay, they were built in 1955 to 1965, generally a flat roof, six units, ten units, four units, um, and... Uh, Mid-century. That's right. And, uh, and they're all under rent control right now. Okay, but we're still getting, San Jose, we're still getting 5% increases. And 
Eighty percent of my buildings are Section Eight. I don't have any problem getting market close to market rent, and um, uh, and I don't have to hassle with this. You know, the Did people. Eighty percent is your. Eighty uh, percent of my buildings are Section Eight. Oh well, then I I talked about Zoma. Yeah, and right. I I can I can look that up and see what that is. Oh, that's that is funding that's available for you, man. Well, I, yeah, that's what you were going to do. You're not going to use your notification to your project. Your name on it. I'm only saying that you have your name on it. You're probably the only one that qualifies in this one. Right? <laughs> <laughs> no, there's others. There's others. Here. You're related to the pay phones. The pay phones, you get property value, not too much in your respect, but um, property value, pay shoes, property value is to lend you the money to go and do all these upgrades. And then you can take advantage of tax credits and pay it back at, you know, starting within 12, 18 months. It just depends on the, on the assessor. Um, but you take the money and you get, it's like you pay a fee for the money, it's an origination fee, and then you get the access for this money. Now you're going to do all your work. You just sell, you do whatever it is you want to do that you can, uh, that you've decided to, to, that you're going to do to upgrade the property. Once you've done that, you're now saving. You're saving on the operating costs of the building, you're saving the tenants' come, uh, uh, income on, uh, for the utility expense. And now you're able to offset that with an rental increase. Now I know you guys are in um, rent control. We have rent control in California, all over this place. But that also there's ways to get around some of those restrictions on your on your rent control. So you can get the rental increases you need to offset the cost that you're going to spend. But that cost you're going to spend is going to be nominal when you break it all down. And if you're using other people's money, you're not coming out of pocket. So if you're not coming out of pocket any money and you, you, you've improved your property, you've improved your property value, and now you're increasing your rental rates, you're increasing your income, now your net income, net operating income goes up. I mean, it just compounds now to going all the way over, uh, down the line to so it actually benefits you. <coughs> if you notice that one slide that I used, it has a net cost of $57,000, $5,700 on a $20,000 expense. I mean, you don't get that anywhere else. Now, if you use paste to pay that 20 grand, you're still not out of pocket any money. The net cost that's going to come out of money is going to be the payments on that paste loan. Now, that paste loan could be um, spread out over 20 years, but it's, there's no prepayment penalty, so you can pay it off at any time. But you've got first year to 18 months of whatever savings you're making throughout that 18 month period before you have to start making back payments. So theoretically, the way the process works, if you've saved enough money so that by the time that payment comes due, you've got the money saved up from the savings to make the payment. So you're never coming out of pocket. Now if you consolidate that pay loan into your mortgage of the, of the property, now you even spread it out even further, and on top of that you've got a, the, the amount of money that's going to increase in the mortgage, minus the incentive that you took, it's going to make it so that by the time you sell this property, it, it, unless you keep it until you die, you're going to have a profit on that. You're not going to spend the 20000 and you're probably not going to spend the 5000 Not over time. It's just leveraging the money of how you spend it. Or you can just take money out of the equity, or you can take it out of your savings. One of the two. <coughs> Any other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, earlier, uh, you mentioned that the solar panel was uh, great and that uh, yes. efficient. <coughs> Right. Yeah. So, so basically, uh, on solar systems, uh, there's a degradation for modules. Okay, and it's usually about a half half percent per year. Now, some solar modules that I deal with, like SunPower, uh, their degradation they say 2.5, but actually it's about uh, one tenth of a percent. So, in other words, after 25 years, uh, you're still producing about 93 percent. That's still good. And uh, if we're, for instance, like SunPower, uh, their average uh, lifespan on their system is about 40 years. That's, that's going to outlive all of us. Now, the thing is, your standard uh, module is about 30 years. So when you take a look at deciding what kind of solar system you want, well, you want to decide, well, how long, what kind of quality, durability, how long is this solar system going to last? Those are really important things. Uh, so the standard warranty, for for instance, for a solar system, 
for modules is 25 years. And usually a solar company would provide a 25 year warranty, which is usually just parts and labor up to 10 years. Well, uh, another company that I deal with, that we're partners with, with Sun Power, they deal with a 20, uh, 25 year warranty, which is parts, labor, workmanship, production guarantee, everything. So as a property owner, you probably would like that because it takes care of everything. And you got your solar solar panel, and then you got your inverters. Inverters lifespan is between 10 to 15 years. And for solar systems for apartment complex or commercial, it's really important they have a long warranty. So uh, what I do for my clients is we, we put a 20 year, if we can, 25 year warranty, uh, which is parts and labor if you can. Uh, because you don't want to, you want to have peace of mind. You don't want to have to have to deal with uh, any issues. Now, maintaining the solar system is really simple. There's no moving parts uh, for solar panels. They they just sit there, right? Uh, and you just have to watch it. So to answer your question, if you want to get rid of your degradation, you wash it once or twice a year. You know, and if you don't want to wash it, you don't have to wash it. It just means there's more degradation, less production, and so that's what that means. And so in regards to uh, the process of a solar system, uh, you go through the design process, you go through the engineering, you get the permits, and then what happens is you do an installation part of it, then you gotta go through the PTO, which is uh, uh, the PG&E, the utility interconnection, and then the solar system is running, and that's a process. Now, for single family homes, the process is really short uh, because you can go over the counter and get the permit real fast, so you can get these solar systems uh, uh, built from the time that you sign a contract, uh, uh, probably within 30 or 60 days. But for a commercial, or for a, a multi-family residential, that's going to take a while. It's going to take probably maybe between four months to six months, or maybe up to a year. Uh, it just depends on the kilowatt size, the size of the system. Uh, is it a flat roof top? Is it a tile? Is it a composite? All those things are, are involved. So that's, that's pretty much how it works, yes. Can you talk about the, uh, I think there's a new tile size, group tile size uh, solar panel. Yeah. Uh, Tesla, right? Yeah. Yeah, I, I love Tesla, because they promote the solar industry. Even though they're my competitors, I, I wish them well, because they market really well, okay? Then what they do is they really market to you guys to educate you about what solar is about. Now, in regards to the, the tile rooftop, uh, the technology, uh, the efficiency is uh, half or less. The thing is, is you need more rooftop tiles to do the same thing as a, a regular module, right? So it, it's not there yet, but the technology will get there soon. I'm sure it will get there soon. Yes? So if you have solar ready and you install a battery, um, short, and you don't have an electric vehicle at this point, Yes. Um, what what would be the pros of Ah, well, think about it. Well, how often uh, do you lose uh, electricity in your house or the facility? Not very often, right? Yeah. Okay, so there's two two reasons why you get the battery storage, especially for your commercial or residential, or uh, one for demand shaving. Okay, and it cuts the you know the cost of your uh, your your utility, and also arbitrage, which is really you're selling it to the utility company at the peak demand price, and of course you're buying it and storing it at the really low price. So you can have ways of saving even more with arbitrage as well. So arbitrage, does that happen in the background? Yes, right. yeah, it's computed with a software program where they, they they sell it at a certain time of the day, and then they you know, buy it. At so you negotiate the sale? No, no, no it's, a, it's a software program where uh, because time of use for us in, the, uh, in the Northern California is changing with PG&E, uh, the battery storage is actually recommended, especially for for businesses and actually for homeowners as well. Okay. Yeah. Arbitrage, though, you're buying the back of pennies on the dollar, right? No, not, not a little bit. No, that's if you're if you're creating more energy than what you use on a solar system, then. That's where you're talking about it's only getting pennies, right? Yeah. But on battery, no. You're getting oh, full. You're talking about battery. I'm talking about battery storage, yes. Yes. Does the battery have benefits when earthquake happens? Well, yeah. Earthquake? With, with earthquake? Of course, because, yeah. 
you'll have electricity and everybody else won't. Right? <laughs> yes, you can set it up uh, where, the, where it can disconnect during an outage. You can do that. Yes. That's what the battery stores will do, especially for homeowners. If you want to be self sustainable and uh, you want to have enough electricity for, for a day or eight hours or whatever, you want a battery store. Yes. I don't have much knowledge of technology of solar. But I've been told they are glass solar and plastic solar. And I've been recommended to use plastic solar. Can well, you talk about well, that? Everything is glass to me. It's a, it's a certain kind of glass. I've never had plastic uh, solar. Unless you're using the really thin film, you know, it's got a certain technology texture, but not plastic. Yeah, your common solar is going to be glass. So right? as far as breakage goes, uh, which one is less likely to break? If well, something falls or that's a good question. That's, that's a great question. The thing is, they put a they put a certain kind of uh, a coating for these things not to break. And matter of fact, they they have testing where you can have a truck just drive over a, a solar panel and it won't break. So it's so very very doable. If there is a breakage, is it still usable or you cannot use yeah, it? That's an excellent thing. question. So I'll give you an example. Your standard PV panel out there compared to maybe a sun power, which is a, your premium, it's like your Mercedes of the, uh, of the industry, uh, that has a Maxian kind of technology. So it's a different kind of cell. If you break it, it still works. But in regards to lower pricing PV panel, if you break it, it does not work. It's because uh, it's an aluminum paste. It's very, very brittle. But with a Maxian cell technology, you can break it and it still works. That's a good question. Anybody else got questions? I think that's it. Hey, thank you very much, everybody, for coming down.